Hey there, guys. Welcome to another show of After the Bell Rings. Um, last week, well, it wasn't actually last week. We've had Christmas break, so I hope you guys have had a happy new year. Um, but two weeks ago, we had Harvey on the show, Harvey Schofield, and that was an amazing um, show. We discussed relationships, behaviours. Um, we discussed some conversations about alternative provisions. If you're a parent and you have a child that may be going to an alternative provision, some of the considerations you can have. And um, Harvey also spoke about some of the great tips to build relationships with challenging children. So if that's an interested, um, an episode you are interested in, by all means, lock into that. Um, we've got the second webinar of a um, pleasant gentleman that we've got with us today, senior leader, author, qualified teacher, John Tate. An absolute pleasure to have you on the show, John. Um, last time I had you on the show, we looked at um, environment in the home and how we can change the environment to benefit learning for the child, how parents can you know, manipulate that environment slightly, just ever so little as well, to benefit learning. And that was a fantastic webinar, that um, fantastic chat that I had with you, John. Um, and if parents are interested in that, please, please do go back to our collection and look at that video, watch that interesting conversation that we had, you know, talking about flat desks, quiet spaces, everything to do with the home. And today it is, it's more about home learning, but today we're focusing on study skills. John's an absolute expert at knowing all about study skills, ways to improve and develop teaching and learning, tons of experience in education. So the perfect gentleman to have on the show to discuss this with. Um, I've got an array of questions, but I'm going to start with a simple basic question. Um, and because there's probably viewers watching thinking, what are study skills? What what even are study skills? So could you tell us, John? Yeah, and thanks, uh, thanks for having me back on, Nathan. It's, it's a pleasure to be back on. So in answer to your question then, it, it's ultimately anything that, that, that lets us learn and retain information effectively. And I think that just like in anything in life, there are ways to do things better and there are ways to do things you know, that, that aren't very effective. And I think that if we can be effective and efficient, and I think those, those two words are slightly different because we can, we can be effective, but it can take lots and lots of work. But if we find that kind of golden, you know, golden thread where we've got the perfect balance between being effective and being efficient with our time, that's really where we want to be in any aspect of our life, isn't it? So if we're talking about learning here, what we really mean is those techniques and those study kind of skills and those ways to revise. If you're, if you're a parent, you might have used that word revise. I don't like using that anymore because I think it has lots of negative connotations of people going, oh, I hated revising. It's like almost like the word dentist or, you know, there's certain words with like exam, it's like, oh, and so I don't like to use that word, but we'll be familiar with that word if you're an adult. So it's any ways that you would use to kind of study or revise, if you want to use that term, to make sure that you can learn information so that we can remember it, because that's what we want to do. We don't want to just take all that time and then not be able to remember it. So uh, there are lots of ways we can do that. There are lots of ways we can do that that are good. And likewise in life, there are lots of ways we can do that that aren't very good, that unfortunately, lots of people have still got bad habits with, because that's maybe the way that we learned. Uh, at school so we kind of pass that down to our children as well so hopefully this will unravel a few of those things and, and let people into a few of the um i suppose if you want trade secrets of how learning really works you know so this is going to be extremely useful for parents or carers anyone that's got that linked responsibility with um, learning and I, I feel like there's a lot of emphasis gets put onto like the subject specifics so you know if you're studying maths it might be you know, the square root of blah, 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 but no one ever actually teaches you how to learn that. We kind of skip that part. And that's what study skills is all about. It, it's what is the best way to learn a square root? It's all good kind of, you know, repeating them formulas and repeating those methods and taking the sheet home that your teacher's given you and practicing at home. But what are the best ways to learn a square root? What are the best ways to learn, you know, about Macbeth or whatever it is that you're studying and that's what John's going to talk to us about today um so I've got another question for you John so what are some of so when we talk about study skills um what are some of the most important <clears throat> skills um required by the students then for when when they're doing studying skills yeah well I think if we, we unpack that a bit and we if we forget about the skills to start with and just look at what are the most important things for students to to understand like you said not the content but actually how we learn it's really important for students and parents to understand well how does the learning process work because when we understand how the learning process works then we can actually put a study skill and fix it on you know and actually work out like, oh this would work perfectly if we don't understand how we learn it's a bit like if you don't understand how your car works you know you don't understand how how the body works if you don't understand how those those things work then actually you can't then choose the right 
strategy for, for moving things forward you know so how the learning process works is that we need to actually in, in lots of things for examinations we have to learn information and retain it and then be able to then retrieve that information in an exam that's generally how the education system works you know you learn things over five years you get tested at the end and the more you can remember the better you do that's in a nutshell very simply how it works so we need to think well what's the what, what's the key factor there it's retaining that information and being able to retrieve it at a minute's notice and likewise in life if you can remember something and a life skill and you can then use it 10 years 15 years down the line whenever you need to you've learned something you know you haven't learned it properly if you can't then retrieve it down the line you've just mm -hmm. been taught it at some point but you haven't really learned it so that's what we need to think about and the way that works is that we need to then be able to retrieve information so the way we do that is we we actually have to continually test ourselves uh, and, and the more we test ourselves, that's the best way of doing it because our, our brain has to do something. It has to actually fetch and carry that information from our kind of long-term memory. And the way it works is that, in, in simple terms, every time we get it right, every time we fetch something and we get it right, so if I ask you a question for something that I taught you three weeks ago and you get it right, then that, that allows me to lengthen the time that I can wait and leave it before I ask you again. So I might ask you in four weeks' time. If you then get it get, get it right again, I can keep extending that time to a period of time where it becomes so permanent that I can ask you in four years' time, and you've got it. So, we, so that's that's that retrieval as well as the spacing element. Um, if we if we don't get it right, when we keep going back, we keep going back. But the more times we get those right, it starts to build a really concrete memory trace. Um, and, and if any adults are watching, and certainly kind of uh, my age. You will probably remember having a landline telephone in your house at some point. And I always say, well, can you remember? And I say this to teachers now. I say, can you remember your first landline phone number? And there's people going, oh, and they just shout out this like 10 or 12 digit number at me. And I'm like, what's that? And they said, that's my first landline telephone number from like 30 years ago. And I say, well, how do you know that now? How do you remember it? And they say, well, I was taught to answer the phone by saying, or one three two five three five, and, and then you, know, you repeat the number out, out loud, or you had to punch it in. You know, not like a mobile phone now where you just tap someone's name. You actually had to do it, and that's how the retrieval process works. Every time the phone rang in my house when I was a kid, I was taught to answer the phone and say the number. That's how I greeted people on the phone. So it was a constant retrieval. So now, thirty years later, because it's completely built into my mind, I can still remember that number, even though I haven't had to use it for, for thirty years. So if we think about that and transfer that into learning, the more we can then quiz ourselves or get people to quiz ourselves on information, and then the longer we can leave it between we, between quizzing ourselves again, that's how we build a really strong memory. So that's what I would say in terms of how what the most important information for students and parents to know is, because once we know that, and then we know, ah, that is how we learn. That is how I learned my phone number. Then we then start to say, right, well, how can we learn Macbeth? All right, well, what, what can we transfer from that situation to that one? Right, we need to do lots of quizzing. We need to do lots of asking questions and, and getting and testing. So that, that ultimately is, again, finding out how the learning process works and then working out which study skills kind of fit into it. And, and that's a, hopefully a perfect example for people who might be watching this and go, oh, I can still remember my friend's phone number, my, yeah. my, my mum, whoever it is, because I had to, I, I constantly had to retrieve that information when I either punched it in the phone or I said it when I answered the phone. And that's ultimately how learning works in a, in a nutshell. It's a really good analogy. I like it. But, um, landline phones, um, yeah, it helps you understand the retrieval process really well. I, there's things I can remember from years ago, like random numbers. You know, it might be the code to like a gate in my garden. And just because I did it so many times, it's like... It's, it's, just, that is, it's, a, it's another perfect example. And it almost, what's quite interesting about that, in, in, in that sense as well, and this is a slight side effect, but like... It, it becomes muscle memory. Like, yeah. actually, you don't even know the number. Like, if you stood there and said, and someone said, what's the number to that door? You might say, I don't know. But you, your fingers just, yeah. you kind of know where well, it is. It's, it's very know. funny you say that because someone actually asked me the code before for the apartment I was living at. And I was like, and I had to just look at a keypad because I knew... I knew yeah, yeah, the direction, but didn't yeah. really, I couldn't think of the numbers off the top of my head. So when we think about like retrieval practice as being, you know, one of the key study skills, how can parents, um, you know, we've spoke about environments, so parents can give their child a quiet space, they can give their child a flat desk, 
how can they prepare their child for the study skills? Like, how, how are they going to support them with retrieval practice? But the, the first thing is, a bit like I said with students, it's understanding the learning process. So as a parent, if you can understand what we've just kind of mentioned there, then you know how learning works, <clears throat> how we remember information. So therefore, once you know that, you can then start to say, well, what can I do as a parent? I can ask lots of questions. I can, mm -hmm. I can do the low stakes quizzing. And, and, and that's very, very easy to do. And I think what we talked about in the, in the, in the last uh, show was that even around the dinner table, potentially, changing those little words about rather than what have you done today, what have you learned today? <clears throat> you know, that, that one word difference. And all that is, that is a low stakes quiz. You are getting somebody to retrieve what they've learned earlier in the day. Exactly the same as asking someone for that phone number or the code on the door or whatever. You're just getting someone to, to do that, fetch and carry. And I know it's only earlier in the day, but it might be the first time they've had to do that. And then when you start building on that, that's when you can then, um, you can be the person that sits down and says, okay, I'm going to ask you 10 questions about what you've learned today. Or tell me what you've been studying or revising for this exam. Show me the book. I'm going to pick out some questions. And it's very low stakes. It's not, if you don't get them right, you don't get your tea. You know, it's just <laughs> kind of, I'm just going to get you because it's, what we need to remember in the learning process is it's not about the score people get. The score makes no difference, realistically. It's the act of retrieving the information that builds the, uh, the, the the deeper memory trace. And if we get them right, great. But even if we don't, the fact that we've had to try and the fact to think about it starts to strengthen that memory trace and it makes that learning more familiar. Especially if you think about a GCSE course that might be two years long, you need to be able to do that regularly and often over the, over the course of the year. Otherwise, when you get to the end of the year, at the end of the two years, you're suddenly going to be tested on things you did two years ago. Now, no yeah. one, no one can remember that unless you've done step by step along the way, or you try and cram it, which is what most of us probably did at school, the night before, and then the day, the, the minute you walk out the exam hall, it's probably gone anyway. So you haven't really learned it for the long term, you know? So yeah. the more that parents can do to actually do the law stakes quizzing, ask the questions, do the testing, you know, do the actual quizzing and the questioning, then that, that, that's a huge kind of benefit uh, in, in terms of the learning process ties into my next question last actually my next question was do you think like study schools are just mainly for GCSE students then and students that are doing um, exam preparation no and I, and I think that if I if I was in charge of the language of the universe I'd probably actually rename it as learning skills rather than kind of study because study suggests that it's you know again it's a bit like a revision isn't it it's like yeah. kind of I need to do this because there's an upcoming test or exam but actually it's just part of the learning process. You know, if you want to learn something, you know, none of us, when we learned that code for the door or, the, or, our, or our landline photo, we didn't do it because we were getting examined. We did it because we wanted to get into the door quickly or answer the phone efficiently or ring somebody quickly. You know, It was because it benefited us, because we wanted to learn it for us. The problem with learning for exams is that we're learning it for a, for a specific exam and for a grade. And, that, and we're not sometimes thinking about the actual learning inside us. So I think that it, it, irrespective of that, it's not about doing it for the test. I mean, yes, you need, you need to do that to get better at a test. But if we're doing it along the way from when we start learning, we almost don't need to get to that point where we have to do the revision at the end of the end of the year because we've been constantly doing it and learning it throughout the year. You know, we, we, we suddenly don't have to learn our phone number after two years because we know it. Because we've been, we've been doing the retrieval. You've yeah. been doing the keypad on the door. You know, you don't need to suddenly go, oh, I've lived here for two years and I'm now going to do the keypad door test. You know, like you've learned it. It's, it's concrete. It, you can do it with your eyes closed. And that's what we need to do with learning. We need to make sure that we're doing that regular, little and often, low stakes quizzing and studying so that we then don't have to actually try and force it upon ourselves because then we all know it goes in one ear, we do the test and it goes out the other ear. It's almost gone before you walk out the exam hall. And that's not real learning for anybody. That's just literally passing a test, which when we say it out loud, is kind of, it, it's quite ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah, so is it more, is it aimed at a particular age? Would you say there's a different approach for different ages with kids, um, you know, primary and secondary, for example? No, I, I, I don't think so. And I think because it's, it's about kind of thinking, well, if, if it's just learning, it doesn't matter what age it is. It's not about GCSEs or SATs or A-levels or degree. And, and I think that the great example I use when I speak to people here is actually think about spelling tests. You know, mm -hmm. we've all either 
being a child ourselves, when we've had to learn a list, a, a, a list of um, words every week, maybe at primary school, or some of us have been parents where we've had to do that and we've had to you know, do it without our own children. So think about, well, how do we learn spellings? What do you do? You get a list of 10 words and what happens? You practice them, you try them, you get one out of 10, then you get three out of 10, then you get four out of 10. And, and what happens? Well, somebody sits there and says, this is a word, you know, you, you know, and if you do it properly, you don't do it in the order that the words are because the person knows what's coming next and they've already, all, they've already remembered them in that order. So you start mixing them up. You know, you say, do we do this one, do that. And that's how you, that's how kids learn at an early age. There's no difference at all from learning a set of spellings at five years old to learning a set of um, dates in history um, or capital cities or quotes in Macbeth or periodic table, um, you know, um, you know and, and, and equations, it's no different. It's actually the whole process of, we've done this since we were four and five years old. We know how to do the spelling test. And if we just take that same idea, we can actually track that all the way through. And again, the more we do that and the better we do it, then you know, the, the, the more permanent that information becomes. So age, I don't think is really a factor. Um, there might be some things that might be more complicated as you get older, but mm. the actual process itself, the actual fundamentals of how do we learn information, whether you are five years old or whether you're 15 or 16 or 18, 20, we, we've demonstrated there. It's very, very similar. Yeah, it's really interesting, actually, because um, I've had some conversations with some educators in previous shows. And I think the word test as well is another one of those words with the connotations that you refer to, because I've had some experts on the show like saying, you know, we shouldn't test children you know, like young children, seven, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, six-year-old, they shouldn't test them. But I understand what you're saying, you're on about in the sense of practicing retrieval, like question and answer, not really the test, one question yeah. one to 10. And yeah, I mean, I mean, it's interesting because I, I say a lot of times as well that if we, if, we, if we change the word test to quiz, yeah, everyone likes a quiz. You know, like, like we don't go to pubs and do pub tests, we do pub quizzes, Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> you know, you, I wouldn't say, oh, do, do you want to go and do a pub test tonight? Mm, no, thanks. Like, oh, there's, there's a pub quiz on, you fancy going? Yeah, yeah, I'm in. Like, it, it's, it, it's a different connotation with the word quiz, but it's ultimately the same, the same idea. I'm going to sit there, someone's going to ask me a random question, and I'm going to have to think really, really hard, and if I get it right, I'm going to be really, really happy. And if I don't get it right, it doesn't matter, because once I know the answer to it, I might get it right next time. Or the next pub quiz will go, oh, that was someone asked me that the other week, it's, um, and I remember it because I've been part of the process. So I think that, I, I, again, I get what people are saying about testing, but I think what they mean is, is that the, the high stakes kind of, you have to get this grade to kind of move on. But ultimately, if we remove that and we have low stakes quizzing, that is how we remember things. We don't remember things unless we have the fetch and carry movement and moments in our head. And to do that, we've got to have that regular quizzing, testing, whatever you want to call it, um, from you know, early age, to, to, to kind of into college and, and, and university. That's how we remember information. And we've, we've demonstrated that by the keypad, by the phone number, whatever you want to, you know, whatever you want to do. That's how we learn information. Simple as that. Yeah, it's really interesting. So one of uh, my other, well, one of the most common forms of study skills is note-taking. Obviously varies on, depending on the age of learner. But I know for myself, when I was at university, that's the only study skill we pretty much use, you know, note-taking, note-taking, note-taking. So my question for you is, do you, think note-taking is an effective way of retaining information and if someone's at home like a teenager or you know young child and they and their, their ways taking notes what would you say is that the best way to retain information and progress it's an interesting question and, and uh, I'll, i'm going to give two sides to, to the answer here so kind of bear with me first of all is not taking a great way to summarize information and get key information now absolutely you know um and there are different ways to take notes you know, things if, if people are listening like the Cornell note taking methods are really really kind of useful uh your way of doing that where you kind of structure your page with different boxes for different questions and what do I need to do next and what are the key elements and that's a really kind of internationally adopted and acclaimed way of taking notes and, and that's really useful especially when you are trying to summarize information or when you're getting to university if you're in a lecture and someone's kind of talking at you and you need to kind of get the main points down then lots of those ways are really really good so that's the first part of my answer is Yes, it's great. It's a great way to um, to collect information, I suppose. The second part of my answer, though, is unfortunately it can lead to a really, really, really bad and dangerous study habit, which is just rereading the notes that you've already written. 
And the reason why that is, and I did this when I was at university, you probably, so many people did it, that we, when we revise or study, we get our notes out again and we reread stuff that we've already written. So our brain isn't working very hard. So cognitively, the wheels aren't turning that fast <clears throat> because we recognize the information. And I've used that word carefully there, recognize. We don't know the information, we recognize it. So because we recognize it, our brain starts going, yeah, 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 yeah. And we start to skim because mm -hmm. we've seen it before. And we lure ourselves into what we call a false sense of familiarity. So we, we, we think we know it because we recognize it. Therefore, our brain does very, very little. We don't do any of the fetch and carry work that we talked about before. We don't do any retrieval. There's no heavy lifting or kind of, or, 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 or big questions or thought or deep thinking, thinking, oh, what was that? We're just literally reading and glancing and nodding along. And, and, and we, we therefore do very, very little. That, make, that becomes even worse if we, in our note taking, we highlight with a highlighter key words or key, key kind of um, vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Because what our eyes start doing is just following the highlights and looking for the highlighted bits. So we therefore skim and read even less of our work because we're just drawn to what we think are the, the, the key words. So we just start looking at key words and key language and our brain doesn't do anything. And if we go back to what works, which is, quizzing, testing, having to think about an answer, we're doing none of that right now if we're just rereading our notes. So cognitively, it's a very, very poor way. So it's a great way to initially collect information, but then actually, if we just reread it, it's really poor. So what we need to do is almost try and reproduce those notes. That's a really, really good way of doing it. You know, So you might, re you might write the notes to start with. You might then, in three months' time, look over them, and then what you need to do is, okay, I'm turning it over now and I'm not looking at it. So it goes over and I've now got to reproduce again, because it's a, it's a fetch and carry retrieval quiz, the main points from that list onto my new piece. Now, if you can do that, perfect. But if all you do is just reread your notes, then it, you, know, you may as well not bother at all because actually you're just luring yourself into that false sense of familiarity that, oh yeah, I recognize it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And nothing's happening. So the best way to do it is that it's what we call like a, a look cover kind of rewrite or a check. You look at look at it, cover it up, and then rewrite it and, and, and test yourself on it. That's a really good way. But unfortunately, people fall into the middle trap of just doing the, the, the bare minimum. And that cover and look is a technique that's used in primary school still for spelling. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's interesting. And I actually asked you that question about note taking because I knew that it's a little bit controversial in the sense of like, you know, how much does it aid learning? Um, yeah, and, and, and I think just like anything, Nathan, it's, it's you know, it's it's not necessarily the process, it's what we do with it, it's how we do it, you know, and you can do not take it really, really well, but equally, you can do it really badly, you know? Um, and it, it's it's not just not taking is bad or not taking is good, it's if you do it like this, and if it leads to this, or it only leads to this, then it's not really worth it. But if it leads to this, 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 and this, and you lead to that kind of cover and check, you know, write and cover type of that activity, again, you know, you reference it there. The spelling test, you know, we, we know how these things work from five years old. Right? It's not difficult. We kind of, for some reason, forget it, or we try and be more complicated, or we try and go, oh, well, even that's primary school. That's how we learn spellings. That's how we learn information. That's how, it's not that difficult when you break it down. It's interesting that like you, you, you came back to the spellings there because that's exactly right, isn't it? That's yeah, yeah. how you do it. You look at them, you cover it up, you practice it. And if you get three, it doesn't matter. You try it again, you get four until you're getting eight, nine and ten consistently. And you're just doing that constant fetch and carry. You know, it is. It's a fairly simple process when we break it down. It's really interesting. So it's probably worth it putting questions on your notes then. Like, let's just say, you know your lectures just lectured you about match of the day and you get some key points probably at the end of it say you know who was man of the match how many why what was his performance strengths you know and ask him to rejog your memory so you've got to actually think and that's, that's it it's anything to to get you to actually think deeply because for too many too many people we don't do that we don't have those that kind of higher cognitive demands when we do our study and our revision it's more of a rereading nodding along yeah, I know this. And it's just a, it's a familiarity check and it's no good.
So it's very easy to fall into that trap of um, just nodding along, taking the notes, being a bit blase with the study. And it's almost like you could probably half your study time if you just did it properly as well for any young people that are watching out there. That, that's that's exactly right. And, and going back to what I said at the start about being efficient, mm -hmm. Yeah. That's exactly it, you know? We can be effective, but we want to be efficient as well. We don't want to spend five hours doing it if we can spend two hours or one hour or 30 minutes. So let's, you know, let's, let's think about doing it in the right way. So what's the best way to um, improve and practice and study skills? Okay, so I, I would always say one of the, the easiest ways, most effective and efficient ways is low stakes quizzing. You've heard me say that already a few times. Um, so getting either yourself to ask yourself questions or getting somebody else to ask you questions. Now, the by far the most popular way that I'm seeing in our schools um, and in all the schools I've worked in and generally uh, of that method is flashcards. Um, and again, lots of people will be familiar with flashcards uh, in certain kind of in, in certain guises, whether, you, whether you've done it before, whether you've seen it, whether you've heard about it really easy to do and really effective. Um, so that that enables you to ask either yourself questions so you might have um a card you turn it over you know you're asking a question you see the answer that type of stuff or again with parents going back to how parents can help give them the cards they can randomly select which question they're going to ask you and they ask you you know it's, a, it's very similar to a you know to a quiz you know we like sitting around probably at christmas and doing you know little quizzes and i you know i was in we, we've got quite a few kind of quiz games on our table at the moment in our, in our dining room but equally i was at the pub the other day and you know i heard a family behind us they bought a little quiz set and they were asking questions they were flipping the cards over and and it was interesting i was like oh, we've got the same game and i'd heard one of the questions and i was like i know the answer to that now i didn't know the answer before until we played the game i got it wrong but again that memory, that kind of process of, oh, now I've heard that and I know it and now, you know. So, yeah, those flashcards are really useful. Uh, very kind of easy way to do it, definitely. Yeah. Is there any, like, top tips for creating, like, effective <clears throat> flashcards? Because, yeah. yeah, you probably know a bit more than just jot any old random stuff down. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there are certain, again, like, there are certain ways to do it and there are certain ways to, 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 to not do it. Now, you, there are actually companies now doing flashcards where you can buy them pre-populated. So if you don't want the hassle of creating them, you can buy, you know, Shakespeare, um, you know, kind of Romeo and Juliet, you know, question two, you know, sets of those on, on you know, but actually part of what I feel is that the benefit of creating them yourself is that the more you're having to write things down and you're having to think about it and what questions and what answers, that's part of the learning process anyway. So you're almost doubling up on the learning by creating them yourself rather than just buying them off the, off the shelf somewhere. <clears throat> so... First thing is to just to, to go on and buy some like kind of index cards. Um, you know, you can buy them as flashcards or index cards, whatever you kind of want to call them. You can buy them. You can get packs of 50, 100, 500 and all sorts online. Very easy. Get your cards. The number one thing, though, to remember is only write one question and one answer on it. Because and I'll tell you why that is really important in a minute. So you have one question on the on the front. And then on the reverse side, you then write the answer. Now, it's important to only have one because you need to know when you turn it over, did I get that right or wrong? If it's a question that has a two, if it has like two questions or two or three different answers, oh yeah, I kind of got it right, or I might have got it right, or oh yeah, uh, and I kind of knew the other two answers. No, no, it needs to be right or wrong. And I'll, and I'll tell you about that's important in a minute. So you might write a picture on it. <clears throat> so in terms of um, promoting some kind of dual coding, in terms of there might be a little diagram on there that kind of jogs your memory as well which kind of helps with the, you know, the kind of double memory trace. Um, and you can then, so you can then have, you know, question on one side, answer on the other side. Now, once you've got those built, there are two ways to use them. And it's interesting that I, I, I don't mind which way this happens because it depends on what subject you're doing or, or, or how you feel about it. Some people like to hole punch all of the, 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 the cards in the corner and buy like a, like a key ring, um, kind of a folio ring and, have them all together so you can then flip them around and they're all you can hang them on 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 the, on the the ring they're all together you don't lose them all and you might then have them all in one topic so all the questions for one topic all on that ring so you have them all together you don't lose them and you're constantly flipping them over etc et <clears throat> that's fine for organization what it doesn't do though is what i'm about to tell you now which i think is a better system in the longer term is what we call the Leitner system, uh, L-E-I-T-N-E-R. And what it means is that you have your, have your uh, questions. If you get it right, so you, you ask the question, you think about the answer, you flip it over, did I get it right? Yes, I'm going to put it in my correct pile over here. Mm -hmm. If I get it wrong, or I guessed it and I got it right, which means I didn't really know it, it was just a guess, I put it in my unconfident pile over here. 
And what you then start doing is you sort them into your unconfident and your confident pile. Once you've got your unconfident pile, you then ask yourself more questions from the unconfident pile, because those are the ones you don't know, yeah. rather than the ones that you do know. That's the problem of the ring system. You can't sort it into confident and unconfident. So therefore it is truly random. That might be fine, but at some point you want to home in on the areas that you're not very good at. And with the, with the lightness system, with the different piles, that's quite nice to be able to kind of shift them around. Um, so yeah, different ways of doing that. Um, or you might decide that you have, rather than a, rather than a proper ring, you might have one of those, um, those kind of fabric tags uh, that you kind of put on. So you can open it quite easily, take them all off from your pile, uh, you know, your unit, and then select, set them in your piles. Um, but that's the, the, that's the best way of doing it. And students find that really easy because then you can sit down and test yourself, but also you can give them to somebody else and a parent can test you. And all I would say is that say the answer out loud. So don't just go, um, I think I know that, and then start looking over the corner because then you're not really testing yourself. Yeah. You're, waiting for the, you're waiting to see it. Actually, say the answer out loud to yourself. You know, so what's the capital, capital city of England? London. Yeah. Oh, yes, it was right. Rather than, um, uh, um, oh, yeah, yeah, it was London, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, you're not going to get it right in an exam. So actually physically say it out loud, and then it, it makes it really easy. So, yeah, that, that would be how I would say to do it. Nice and easy. It's a nice learning exercise, actually, creating the cards yourself, because you, you go through your, your notes or your revision guides or your textbooks, and you look at what are the key things I need to learn. I need to learn this, right? So I need to write a question about that. What's the answer? Well, the answer is this, right? And you put it, so already you're finding out the key information and the answers just by creating the cards. So even that's a learning exercise. So yeah, I think it's really useful to do that. It's really good points that you're making there because flashcards are so easily, you can access it, it's just a four piece of papers, really, not even that. You can find scrap paper. You guys can make anything at home. Put it up. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you don't need card. cards. are nice because they, they have more longevity yeah. and they're going to they're gonna keep longer. But yeah, you don't need to go out and buy cards. You can literally buy, you know, just, just a lot of paper. And like I said, rip it, cut it up, you know, and just, you know, if, if suddenly you had a test in five minutes and you were, where am I going to get flashcards from? Piece of A4 paper, very quickly, write the questions down, rip them, put the answer on the other side, have your pile, quick, 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 quick test and, you know, test and retrieve, done. So you don't need anything flash, flashcards. However, <laughs> the, the longevity of them on, on card, you know, if you're going to use them throughout the year, Clearly, it's uh, you know it, it's it's going to pay dividends at, at some point anyway. I want to put some emphasis on as well, saying the answer out loud because that's so powerful. When I was having my music lessons and you're learning chords, anyone that's done music lessons will know that the teacher will get you to say the note or the chord out loud because you're ten times more likely to remember. You can have the like for me it was on guitar, so I could have like the chord shape with my fingers and I'd know it, but I'd forget what the chord was called. And that's because I didn't practice saying it out loud. As soon as I started saying it out loud, every time I played it, the shape of my hand just triggered the word. It was, it's weird. So I'm, um, yeah. yeah and, and it's those little tips and tricks and those like you said, trade secrets from whether it's music, education, sport, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it, for some reason, it makes it work and yeah. just stick with it, you know. And, and people might say, Well, I'm, I'm going to sound silly in my bedroom. Who's watching? <laughs> like, <laughs> doing? would you rather know this information and would, would you rather be more efficient with your time? Yes. Well, why not do it? You know, close your bedroom door, have your flashcards, you know, say it out loud. You know, it, it, it's whatever it is, whatever it takes to learn that information. Because again, thinking about the landline phone number. You know, when you answered the phone, you did say it out loud. It was an, an actual yeah, verbal true. process, you know? So, uh, yeah, definitely. Very good point. So, obviously, I know you're a father and a teacher and have been for, you know, some good years now. So, you've got a lot of experience working with children. Um, so, what, you know, you've had experience encouraging maybe your own children and your students to practice their study skills. What would you say that's been successful? What would you advise and recommend for parents to try that you've done and kind of, you know, you've seen it's worked? Just start as early as possible, you know, and 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 then that really is it. It's, it's start as early as possible, build the habit and don't just see it as exam prep. You know, I think we've covered this earlier in, in, in the webinar anyway, but build it in as part of the learning process. How do we learn? Not how do we cram and how do we... <laughs> how do we ace the exams? How do we learn this information? Because I bet anyone listening now, think about all the subjects you studied at school. How much of that do you actually know and actually 
properly know right now. Probably not a lot of it because actually we didn't do these things. We didn't build these habits. Yet we know the door code. We know the number. We know the four, you know, we know the, we know the things that we did right. You know, yeah. we know the spellings. We, you know, the, and you're thinking, wow, yeah, yeah, this is interesting. You know, the, the things that I did right and, and, and we did in those processes, I still know right, right now. Right, well, you know, th- th- there we go. So I think it's, yeah, start early, build it into the process, build it into a regular routine, weekly, monthly, fortnightly, you know, that type of stuff. Um, and also I, 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 what I always see is that students that do this are always far more prepared and less panicked when it comes to exams. Because let's face it, they already know the door code. They already know the phone number. So why would they be panicked? You know, they know it, out, they know it off the top of their heart. It's concrete information to them. They can close their eyes and hit that keypad, you know, in, in, in relative terms. Whereas the people that haven't been doing this are going, oh, I, I need to know like a nine digit number and I need to know how am I going to know this? And, and they try and cram it all the night before. So it becomes very stressful. The people that have been doing these learning processes and using the study skills and constant retrieval and the fetch and carry in their mind across the year can almost walk into an exam without any revision the night before because they actually properly know this information yeah. and, and and that's got to be got to be great for anybody you know it, because yeah, yeah. the last thing we want is the stress and the mental pressure of having to cram for exams and then walking out of the exam and then the next day thinking i've forgotten it all because it was literally like so therefore what's the point you yeah. Know? So, yeah definitely it's really interesting that you, you just mentioned like the mental health side of things as well because it's a really good point because when when I was working with year 10s and 11s, a lot of them have a lot of anxieties. Um, they get really nervous to where they don't even want to enter the exam hall. And these are like able, confident students that have the ability to achieve. But yeah, they've got themselves into a pickle, unfortunately, because they've tried to cram it in. So that's another thing for like parents and viewers to consider um, retrieval practice. It, it helps supports the mental health in the long run because students aren't going to get to a specific date in their school career and be like, right, I've got to learn as much as I can in these next 12 weeks, which is probably, from my experience of working in the public schools that I've worked at, is that's probably the, the more common, you know, that's the most common approach, um, unfortunately, to studying and, and you know, f- throughout those last couple of school years. Yeah. Sorry, just the amount of students that I've had that are like in year 10 and they're almost reflecting on their whole school career and being like, right, this is the year I've got to knuckle down. And it's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And if we can build those habits right from the start, that this is how learning works and, and they become, and I think we'll talk about this in, 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 in probably a future or whatever, but they become actual habits that you just do. Then you don't even need to think about it. It just happens. You know, at the end of the week, you do a little bit of quizzing, you do some little, you know, it just it becomes, you know, whereas when we have to think, we have to make choices and we have to decide, oh, I've got to start this. How am I going to do it? That's when we could become stressful because you've got lots of decisions to make. If it's just a habit of, I've been doing this for years now, you know, it's automated. Like when we get in a car, you don't, you don't have to think. You know, if you've got to think about all the things that happen in a car when you're driving, like you wouldn't drive a car. But because <laughs> they are habits and they're, and they're kind of hardwired to us now, they're automated responses, you know, and we know these things. Then you can drive, you know, down, I mean, I drove this afternoon down, down a road with parked cars both sides, sun beaming right down, somebody stepping out, a car coming down, you know, rain and, and all these types of things where, uh, you know, my son who's driving and learning to drive at the moment, it would be too much for him to process all those things. But I'm just like sailing down because actually all those things are automated now, you know, and, I, and I've learned them and I know them. And I'm not having to then think about all these things. Again, just like getting to the door and pressing the cord in, you're not thinking about what's the actual number. You just get there and it's, it's muscle memory, bang, in we go, you know? So, yeah, the more we can do that, the less panicked we get we don't have to make decisions we don't have to think and we can use all of that extra uh, mental capacity to do other things with we're not then having to kind of take up all that mental capacity by making big decisions and that's when we get stressed we need to be able to leave all that for other things and, and yeah the more we can do that then and that's the same with anything you know um sports music whatever it is you know you get to a point where it's totally automated an automated process so you've got the, all, all of your mental capacity is able to then take in the surroundings of other things rather than think about the cord, where am I standing? Is the power on? Because if you had to do that, like there's yeah. no way you'd do it, is there? You know, from a music point of view, you'd just be a, a, a you know a nervous wreck. <laughs> Definitely. And another thing I'd say is actually, is that's a good point as well. The nerves, the nerves can have a big impact because actually one of, when I used to teach younger people, I was all, I would always say, just believe and relax. 
and they'd always perform better. Um, but yeah, that's a whole, we can probably tie that into our next webinar, which is all yeah. about optimizing um, your body, your mental, physical health to perform as best as you possibly can. Um, academically as well that the way I said that it sounded like it was like a sports event or something like that but no you know adjusting our health so we can actually perform academically and it's something that I'm I'm very passionate about actually um, that, 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 that's exactly it and I know you mentioned though you you were talking about sport but but that is it that that it, it's and I you know we'll, we'll get into this now in our next webinar but you know th treating your body and your mind like an athlete or a sports person or a musician would do you know they wouldn't rock up to the Olympics having no sleep the night before and having tried to read their training program and their strategy for the race all night yeah. for the first time and then woke up late, throw a Red Bull down the neck, That's not have their breakfast and run and, you know, like, and, and not iron their kit. You know, they just, it'd be like, what? Yeah. Everything is planned and prepped to the minute, you know, and working back from that race. And we, again, we need to think about how we would then take the lessons from sport and music and performance, whatever, whatever performance it is, into, into the lives of students, because you know, we need to be mentally and physically ready to, pre to pre perform in that exam, having done all those things previously, like the sports form, you know, practices all the time, does the retrieval practice, even though it might not be sitting there in the quizzing, it's, they, are, have, they have to continually um, deal with those problems and issues in the games or in, in, in whatever mm -hmm. sport they're doing. Because, so they, they, they are retrieving that information all the time. What do I do when the ball comes here? What do I do when a defender comes here? When this space is given to me, what do I do? It's all it's exactly the same. It's just like learning the court, learning the, you know, the periodic table. It's just constantly revisiting different situations, different scenarios, but under pressure. Um, so yeah, the more we can think about it in that terms, I think it then starts to help students because they would never... The, you know, the team or the, the, the people they support or the, the musicians, they wouldn't spend £100 a ticket to go and see Ed Sheeran, let's say, and think that he just literally rocked up with no practice and, and spent yeah. all night trying to remember his lyrics. Like, you know, like, it's like, would you really expect that? No, I wouldn't. Like, well, well, why do you expect that you can get through that with your exams then or you know, your your team, you know, your sports team? You, know, you wouldn't expect them to be to be doing that. And, and you, know, you, you want them to be well prepped because you know what peak performance is. So why is there any difference for us as, as students and as adults? So yeah, absolutely. I working in the schools, I've had a lot of experience with students that are up till 4 a.m., have a Red Bull for breakfast, don't have anything to eat, maybe have, you know, a bag of crisp out of the um, dining room. And then um, you know, fourth period, they can't focus and they're like, I just don't know why. And I'm like, I don't think that's a coincidence, but that's what we're gonna get into on our next webinar. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show again, John. Looking forward to having you on next time. Um, always love plucking your brains and learning more about you know different areas of learning and by the end of the third webinar parents can watch all three webinars and you've got literally the information that you need to really help support your child at home whether that's revision or homeschooling or remember your child's outside of the classroom 85 percent of the time so it's worth knowing how to support that learning journey uh, absolute pleasure having you guys tune in and thanks john for joining us on the show and i'll see you guys next week